Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another neuroethics seminar in our neuroethics seminar series. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Brain Initiative and the International Neuroethics Society, which supports our webcasting. If I could, I would apologize to the people watching via webcast who are not currently connected, but hopefully will be very shortly. Uh, we also have a number of uh, co-sponsors uh, that are shown here, uh, and as always, we're very grateful for their support. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, a topic that gets discussed often in ethics circles and in neuroethical cir uh, circles quite a bit, which is brain death. Uh, and for those of you who run in these circles, this may feel like, you know, a very familiar, maybe worn out topic for some of you. But we've got a very interesting take on uh, brain death today because uh, the topic is cross-cultural issues in brain death. And we've got uh, two excellent speakers uh, tonight to talk about this issue uh, from hopefully a fresh uh, angle for all of us. Uh, Dr. Ching Yang is a fellow in anesthesia at Massachusetts General Hospital now, uh, and more importantly for our purposes, she was recently a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Neuroscience and Society, uh, at which time her work focused on cross-cultural issues uh, in brain death. Uh, and she's going to be talking to us uh, about brain death and about uh, that work. Uh, to comment uh, after her remarks, uh, we have Dr. Bob True, who uh, will be familiar to most or all of you, uh, a world uh, expert and world-renowned, perhaps infamous, uh, in uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, brain death. Um, I was telling he, he may be he may be a little bit tired of the brain death topic uh, himself. Uh, I had him talk to my master's class this week, and he was just in Chicago giving a, a lecture in the McLean series. Uh, on just this topic, uh, but hopefully for him too, this will be uh, something slightly fresh uh, and interesting, and I know that we'll all uh, benefit. So I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Yang uh, to be our first speaker. Thank you. 
and his heart is still beating. But his pupils are not reactive. He doesn't respond when we call his name. He doesn't move in any way when we give him a, a painful stimuli. So then, for him, the traditional way of discerning death through the cardiopulmonary criteria is not applicable anymore. And when that window closes, we need to find another window to look into the internal state to see if he is dead or not. And that's what's born the concept of brain death, defined as the irreversible loss of whole brain function. Brain death has three main social utilities. The first one is closure for family. When a family of a patient is told that their loved one is brain dead and that equals human death, they are more likely to uh, be at peace and move forward. Brain death also reduces medical futility and conserves medical resources. And lastly, brain death is a major source of organ uh, donors for transplant in uh, most of the countries that have adopted this criteria. For example, in the US, about 15 to 20,000 people are declared brain dead each year. That accounts for about 10% of all deaths, but 1% uh, of all deaths, but 10 to 20% of deaths in the ICU. About half of those people uh, go, in, go on to become organ donors, accounting for 90% of all deceased organ donors, and that supports over 20,000 organ transplant procedures, potentially saving the lives of about 20,000 people. On the other hand, if we look at the brain death patient, people have done longitudinal observational studies. They found that over 90% of them, even if you leave them on ventilatory and circulatory support, they suffer cardiac arrest within a week. Meanwhile, if we uh, keep them in the ICU each day, if the cost is about $5,000. So if we are able to diagnose and declare brain death in a timely manner, that saves a lot of money for the society. So it is not hard to understand how brain death was quickly adopted into routine medical practice in the Western world after it was um, characterized in the 1950s and 1960s. But it is not quite the case in other parts of the world, particularly Asia, uh, where I come from. Uh, I was born in China and I grew up in Japan. So in those countries, the acceptance of brain death lags behind. Japan had a debate for over 30 years before it finally legalized brain death in 1997. China, the debate still goes on today. So that prompted me to look at what could account for this um, apparent difference between those two parts of the world. So my first question was, is there really a difference in the acceptance of brain death between the West and the East? And for the purpose of my project, I used a working definition of the West as North America, Europe, and Australia and New Zealand. These countries where they share a common um, Western philosophy, whereas the East is mainly focused in East and Southeast Asia. There are a few ways to look at this question. One is to look at if they have a law recognizing brain death as human death. As we know, brain death was defined uh, in the 1968 report from Harvard. And after that, all of the Western countries started drafting legislations. In the US, the Uniform Declaration of Death Act was um, put in place in early 1980s and quickly recognized by all 50 states. And by 1990s, all of the 22 Western nations that I was looking at had a law recognizing brain death. Whereas Asia countries, Asian countries really lagged behind. They only started having brain death laws in the 1990s, about 30 years after the Harvard report. And still, eight out of the 14 countries in Asia do not have a law saying brain death is human death. Another way to look at the differences is to focus on whether the, each country has a national guideline on how <coughs> to diagnose brain death. This could be published from a national medical organization 
or the Department of Public Health. In the West, all of the countries had a guideline. In the East, eight out of the 14 countries did. And when we look at those specific guidelines, we can look at a few different factors. As we know, a brain death diagnosis usually requires two separate clinical exams separated by a certain amount of time. Not all of the countries in the West mandate such a separation of wait time to kind of give the patient a chance to recover if, if the brain death state uh, or the state that were, they were in is reversible. Whereas all of the Western countries mandate this waiting time. The waiting time is also significantly longer in the Eastern countries than the West. And then um, another factor we can look at is how many physicians are required to declare brain death. In the East, the average is two, which is greater than the 1.5 in the West. And also more countries in the East require more than two physicians, or they also require physicians who are specifically trained in a neurological specialty or physicians who are not directly involved in the patient's care to avoid conflict of, of interest. So we can see the guidelines in the Asian countries are more stringent than the Western countries. Then yet another way to look at it is how much of brain death uh, do we see in actual medical practice. This is the number of brain death uh, confirmed from each of the countries selected countries I was looking at in the most recent years. The years range from about 2007 to 2012. So as we can see in the US, we have uh, many brain deaths. This, this was 2011, it's 18,000 18, uh, brain deaths. And in the, um, so it's uh, most of the European countries. But in the Asian countries, we don't have um, as nearly as many some people might say, oh, maybe it's just U.S. has more people, but that is obviously not true. As we know, the per uh, capita brain death rate is also much lower in Asia, especially if we look at uh, very densely populated countries like Japan and China. Now, how many of these brain dead uh, people go on to become donors? Again, we see many more numbers in the Western countries than the East. Interestingly, in China, there is a very active organ transplant program, but just that they don't have many brain dead donors. There has been a few studies looking at public opinions in different countries around the world. They usually ask a question like, do you think brain death is an appropriate standard of brain <coughs> death? And then people can answer yes, or no. And we can see that in the Western countries, far more people answer yes than the Eastern countries. Interestingly, if we look at China and Japan, many more people answer uh, with uncertainty toward this question. They say, I don't know what brain death is, or I'm not sure. So maybe the lack of education or knowledge contributes to their rejection of the brain death concept as well. So through this um, overview, we can uh, kind of answer my first research question. So compared to the West, we see that Eastern societies are slower at adopting brain death into legislation, to the point that some of the countries are considering a two death option. Uh, one example is China, where in the debate, people are proposing that maybe individuals can choose whether their death, uh, they want to be declared dead according to the cardiopulmonary or the brain death criteria. The Eastern societies are also slower at applying brain death in medical practice. And then more reluctant, the, the people in those societies appear to be more reluctant to accept the concept of brain death. Then the next question that brings us to is why. So when we think of why, we think back to the cultural and the religious roots of those societies and we wonder if this can help explain the differences that we observe. And the majority of the literature comes from the medical anthropology field. I want to share a few examples that I saw on the media online. Uh, these are not videos, 
uh, just cliffs. So this is a, a local example from Lowell, Massachusetts. In 2011, an 18 year old high school student had a snowboarding accident and was declared brain dead about a week later. His family decided to uh, donate his organs. So this is his mom who was interviewed and she said, we've decided that being brain dead, this means his life is over. And we've decided to donate his organs to give others the gift of life. This will help a lot of people. I think her example illustrates two important points about how brain death is perceived in the West. First, Westerners tend to see brain death and equate it with death of the individual, death of the person. And they think of donating organs from a brain dead person as a gift of life for others. And this we can track back to the philosophical roots of the Western society, where there is a clear separation between the mind and the body. And the thought is that the soul really controls the body, and humans are rational beings characterized by this controlling relationship between soul and body. And the brain is where the soul lives. Therefore, when the brain is dead, the soul is no longer able to exist and the control of the body is just an empty shell. Then also, as time moves on in the Western society with the Industrial Revolution, we have the, the, these um, ideologies of pragmatism and utilitarianism that shows that brain death is useful and also convenient, particularly it conveys those social utilities that we discussed before. In addition, brain death concept fits very well with the traditional religions of the Western society. Both Judaism and Christianity advocate that the process of dying should not be prolonged, and there is a separation between the body and the soul. Also, the brain death concept has been officially endorsed by authorities of the religions in the West, which includes the Pope, the rabbis of both Israel and America, and also the Islamic uh, Fiqh Council. So they have all declared that they recognize brain death as human death uh, some, sometime in the 1980s to early 1990s and um, they also leave up to the medical profession to, uh, to decide how to diagnose and declare the dying process. On the other hand, we can look at a few examples from the Eastern society. So this is a Chinese family in Singapore. It's a 40-some-year-old man who had an intracranial hemorrhage and was presumed to be brain dead. Now, Singapore is a very interesting country in that they have a brain death policy uh, that is an opt-out system. So everybody who is a Singaporean citizen automatically they can be declared brain dead if clinically uh, suitable and can be made an organ donor unless they made a specific request before they, they are dead. So here the family um, does not believe that their loved one is, brain, is dead. And uh, they requested a 24-hour uh, waiting period to see if the person would come back. And the hospital refused and brought the patient into the operating room for organ procurement. So one of the family members says, I don't know why they say brain dead means he's dead. I don't believe it. He's not dead. His heart is still beating and his hands still warm. Then another example, this is from Japan. So this is a middle-aged man who uh, is, had a stroke and is presumed to be brain dead. So in Japan, they approved a law uh, saying brain death is human death in 1987. But brain death, declaration of brain death was used only in the context of organ donation. So only if the family agrees to donate organs would they proceed with the brain death exam and then declare the person brain death. Otherwise, they'll wait for the person's heart and lungs to fail and declare the person dead using the cardiopulmonary criteria. So here the wife receives information about the brain death exam from the doctors 
and she asks this question. So the second brain death exam determines the time of death. Does that mean that even if he himself makes an effort afterward, the time of death will not change? So here we can see that he, she still does not think that her, her husband is dead, that she thinks that the exam itself will artificially declare brain death, the death on her husband. And at the end, she actually declines organ donation and the brain death exam because she wanted to see him all in a more natural way. Lastly, we have an example from China. So this is a very young woman who had a car accident and is bec uh, now becomes brain dead. And her husband agreed to the brain death exam and the donation of organs. However, his reason for donation is very different from what the Massachusetts family had said earlier. So he says, for my wife to be able to continue living in this world through other means, that is easier for us to accept. To us, she is still here, just her body is gone, but she has not left. So we can see that he sees the act of organ donation as more of an extension of his wife's life, rather than a gift for other people. So through those examples, we can see that in the East, brain death does not necessarily equal death. And death means the loss of hope. So the family likes to maintain hope by rejecting brain death. And also, organ donation is thought of an extension of the dead person's life rather than a gift for others. And some see organ donation as a mutilation of the body and thus they reject it. How do we explain this kind of philosophy? And we have to go back and think about the traditional religions and philosophical beliefs of the East such as Shintoism and Taoism. In the East, the body of the human being lives in kind of a uh, single unity with nature. So this is really the world of Princess Mononoke, if you recognize this cartoon, uh, where not only there's not a, a clear separation between the soul and the body, the soul is distributed everywhere, but also the spirit does not necessarily live inside the body. It can go beyond and connect with the forest and the ocean and the sun. So it's hard to say where does one individual end and where does the spirit end when the body um, is, uh, is dying. So there's a, a lot of integration between the body, the spirit, and the soul. And there is a lot of all toward life, where people think life should not be controlled, but life should be respected and old. Death is also a very ambiguous process, as we saw from the Japanese example, where they don't know clearly where, when the person has left this world. So to have an artificial stop time by using the brain death exam seems very unnatural to the uh, Asian mind. In addition, there are some beliefs about life in the Eastern philosophy that kind of goes against brain death. For example, in Buddhism, there are um, thoughts that there are three uh, hallmarks of life, vitality, heat, and sentience. So vitality is thought of as the energy that drives life as the energy is producing heat, which is thought of as the outward expression of life. So when a brain dead patient lies on the hospital bed, he is still warm. So the body heat, as we saw in the Singaporean example, becomes a sign of life rather than a sign of death. Also people think the consciousness and uh, the soul exist far beyond the brain. The brain is not really a dominant organ at all in Western philosophy, particularly in Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine for thousands of years have ignored the brain. There are many organs that the Chinese medicine has explored and many um, these channels of the energy that they think it's, uh, the life flows through, but none of those channels goes to the brain. 
So to say that brain is the organ that controls the rest of the body is inconsistent with those Eastern beliefs. In addition, um, that brain death is often connected to organ transplant and uh, organ donation, the idea, the beliefs about reincarnation is often used to refute the need of brain death and organ transplant. People believe that if we take a part of a human out, a part of the organ out, the person will be reincarnated without that part. For example, if they donate cornea, they will be born blind in their next life. So those beliefs can deter people from becoming donors. Although Buddhism is not completely against organ donation, as the legend goes, Buddha once sacrificed himself to feed a group of hungry tigers. So the idea of sacrifice is also in, uh, in the beliefs of Buddhism, and uh, people are encouraged to go through suffering in order to have a better next life. Lastly, another um, part of the Western society uh, social beliefs that may contribute to the resistance against, against brain death is the Confucianism beliefs about social structure. So instead of an autonomous individual that is widespread in the Western world, the Eastern world, the person really exists within a network of relationships, relationships with the family, with friends, with superiors, with the monarchy, and with uh, the offsprings. So sometimes the dying person is forced to live on for the sake of others, rather than to be allowed to complete the dying process. And lastly, not, unlike the Western religious authorities, none of the Eastern religious authorities have endorsed or voiced any kind of clear opinions about brain death. So the lack of religious guidelines may also contribute to people's confusion about brain death. So through the anthropology uh, discussions, we can see that the religious and cultural perspectives in the East and the West are consistent with how the societies are receiving brain death and organ donation. And the lack of clear religious guidelines may also contribute to the confusion about the concept of brain death in the East. But is this really just a war between those cultures? How much of Socrates and Confucius beliefs really contribute to people's decision making in the modern society when we have technologies and uh, medical diagnostics that did not exist thousands of years ago. So this brings us to uh, my project, which I've been working on for the past couple of years, uh, a more empirical look at how people make decisions about brain death in the East versus the West. So this is a survey study of medical providers. Um, we uh, had about 400 samples from a medical center in the US, uh, which is Yale, where I trained, and uh, a medical center, academic center in China, uh, in southern China. And we, uh, the survey had three parts. So first, we asked them about their background, including demographics, educational background, and cultural and personal beliefs. Then we asked, assessed their knowledge about brain death to see if confusion and lack of education about the concept would play a role. And then lastly, we give them clinical scenarios describing a brain dead patient and ask them if they would declare this patient brain uh, dead, officially dead, um, or, and uh, if they would uh, allow the withdrawal of uh, supportive measures like ventilation and uh, blood pressure support uh, or uh, tube feeds and if they would uh, lastly allow the procurement of organs from this patient. So a little background about uh, this sample. Uh, as we can see, many more uh, medical providers in the US were religious than, the, than China, 
which is expected as China has been under communist rule for the past 60 years and has become more secular. Also, many more people in the US believe in the existence of soul than China. And then when we ask them where do they think the soul lived, surprisingly, brain was not the majority. So in either cultures, uh, people did not really think the soul specifically resided in the brain. And more people thought the soul was distributed throughout the body. So that was the first surprise about our result. <coughs> then we asked them what do they thought, what do they uh, think of as a sign, sign of death. So as we can see, majority of people believe in the cardiopulmonary criteria, specifically the lack of heartbeat as a sign of death. More people in the US thought uh, aligned with a more brain-centric definition of death, such as no brain activity, um, EEG, or lack of motor function, such as reaction to pain, uh, compared to uh, fewer people in China. But interestingly, in China, um, overall, people appear to be more confused about what really death is. They were uncertain about death. As we can see, none of those had an overwhelming positive response. So that maybe suggests uh, that there is consistent with this belief about ambiguity about the transition from life to death in the Eastern cultures. Then we give them a 12 question brain death knowledge test. So 12 would be the full score. And this was a bit surprise to me as well, because I expected that the uh, Chinese medical providers would perform much worse. But actually, they were comparable. And uh, even though the statistically it was still significant, but really there was not much of a difference in their scores. So these were the, uh, the specific questions. We asked if they think a brain dead person could breathe on their own, could ever wake up, could react to painful stimuli, could move in any way, uh, could hear others or know that their family is there, could swallow, could excrete, could shed tears. And the last few questions about how brain death can persist for a long time in that brain death state, whether a person with a beating heart can be declared brain dead and the difference between brain death and persistent vegetative state. So the main difference between the, uh, the American and the Chinese uh, answers kind of focused on the last few questions. So um, concerning the chronicity of brain death, the, um, the fact that a person with a beating heart can be declared brain dead, and the preservation of these autonomic and spinal cord functions So we see that the Chinese provider's knowledge about brain death was not, uh, was not too bad. Now how about do they think brain death uh, is ethically acceptable or not? And also here was surprising to us too, because both in both countries, majority of providers thought brain death was ethical. Um, they think it could be an ethically acceptable way to determine human death. Then we asked if they believed that uh, brain death was legal in uh, the place where they lived. So uh, to clarify, we know that brain death is legal in the US, but it is not legal in China because there's no law saying brain death is human death. So half of people in the US thought correctly thought brain death was legal, but half was not sure. Uh, in China, half of people thought it was not sure and uh, surprisingly, about a quarter of people actually believed it was legal. Then when we ask, uh, give them the scenarios of uh, the brain dead patient, and then we ask, uh, do you think this patient is actually dead? Would you declare death on this patient? Um, from what we learned before, they think brain death is ethical. Some believe that brain death is legal and uh, they have a good knowledge about brain death, the, the clinical science of brain death. So they should recognize this patient is brain dead and uh, 
consequently, they should be able to accept that we get this debt. So that was the case in America, where majority of providers thought okay, this patient is dead. But only half of the providers in China thought so. So if we think ethical acceptance of brain death should translate to uh, acceptance of brain death as dead, then we would expect at least about 69% of providers would say yes to the last question. But the, what we got was less than that. So um, that prompted us to explore further as to how they made that decision and what kind of characteristics was correlated with this practical acceptance of brain death. So we did some regression analysis. And here we see that in both countries, ethical acceptance of brain death is uh, significantly uh, related to the practical acceptance of brain death. Also believing that brain death is legal uh, mattered a lot for those providers. And then high knowledge score, if they know the clinical signs of brain death, help them apply that to the clinical scenarios as well. But what was uh, very interesting for us to see is that religion and the beliefs about, uh, religious beliefs did not really matter. So whether the provider had a religious belief or not, whether they thought the human had a soul or not, uh, whether they believed in world after death or reincarnation had no effect on how they dealt with the brain dead patient in the clinical uh, simulation. Uh, the only thing about uh, these beliefs that had a significant effect is whether they believed that the brain, uh, the, the brain is where the soul lived. But as we saw before, that is a minority of people. So we think there's something else that could be contributing to their decision. So we ask them directly, when you think about making decisions about brain death for your patients, what are the factors that matters the most to you? And they uh, were asked to rank these different aspects uh, in the order of zero to five, zero being the most important, but zero being the not, not important at all, and five being the most important. And uh, a few things stand out. We see in both China and the US, legality of brain death mattered a lot to those providers. So they wanted uh, protection from law in order to make a declaration of brain death so that they do not get sued by the patient's family when they make such a determination. They also um, thought about education and knowledge mattered a lot to them. Interestingly, uh, a couple of things that stood out uh, is that in the U.S., more, pro more providers thought religion mattered a lot to them than in China. Whereas in China, things like medical liability and defensive medicine uh, was more of a concern for the providers. And both, in both countries, they ranked the emotional aspects and emotional attachment between patient and family and provider and patient to play a role in their decision making as well. So this is our prelim preliminary model where we think uh, in reality when people make decisions about a brain death patient, it's a very complex process. And both the provider and the patient background plays a role in this. For the provider, their professional and personal experiences can have a, a effect on how they make the decisions, particularly their knowledge about brain death, whether they think it's ethically, uh, ethically acceptable, and also their emotional connections with the patient and the family. For patient, the relationship with the provider, and in China especially, we see that their financial status and economics of the medical care as well as their advanced uh, age or young age plays a role as well. 
So overall, the answer to my last risk question is that medical decision about brain death is a very complex process. Religious beliefs do not have a significant influence, um, unlike what people have been proposing in the field. Whereas knowledge level, ethical acceptance, and legal acceptance can contribute to the differences we see between American and Chinese providers. And lastly, the decisions that people make may actually be intuitive and heavily uh, emotionally involved beyond just the big theories and the uh, philosophies that we uh, think are obvious. But uh, we have some uh, discussion questions uh, that we can talk about later. And lastly, I just want to thank uh, my advisors and the people who supported me uh, in this endeavor. Thank you. pleasure to be able to talk about one of my favorite uh, subjects. Um, I promised Toss I would keep this to about 10 minutes and I can confirm Winston Churchill's uh, point about making a short talk is a lot harder than making a long talk. So uh, I do want to make a few points here about uh, how I see the perception of brain death differing in the East versus the West. But before I do that, I'm going to have to torture you a little bit with uh, some of the background um, to the concept of brain death. So, brain death in the West. Brain death is widely accepted in the West as representing the death of the human being. However, I think that the equivalence of brain death with death rests upon two assumptions that I think are unsupportable. And let me describe those to you and then try to make sense about all of this. So, false assumption number one. The Uniform Determination of Death Act in the United States requires the complete absence of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. But we know that the diagnostic tests for brain death actually examine only a small number of all possible brain functions. And we know that brain dead patients may retain a number of functions, some of which are actually quite critical such as controlling hormonal balance that regulates uh, salt and fluids in the body, and even temperature control. So it's always been interesting to me that when we do a brain death exam, you know, we look very carefully whether the pupils constrict to light. But in fact, that's of rather minimal physiological significance. Uh, any of us could live just fine if our pupils didn't constrict to light. But the testing doesn't look at really physiologically critical brain functions, such as regulation of uh, salt and fluid balance with the uh, hormone vasopressin, temperature control. Uh, it's always struck me one of the ironic things about the brain death exam is that in order for the exam to be valid, the patient has to have an essentially normal temperature. But if the patient has an essentially normal temperature, that means that the brain's functioning. So there's sort of a catch-22 going on here. So I think there's a real problem between the requirement of the law, the complete absence of all functions of the entire brain, and the actual testing that occurs. The second false assumption, I think, is actually the more problematic one. And I'm going to have to uh, abbreviate this here with the limited time that I have, so you're going to have to trust me on some of this. But patients diagnosed as brain dead have been regarded as dead because they have been thought to lack a fundamental requirement of biological life which is the integrated functioning of the organism as a whole. So if you go back in the uh, literature on brain death, the idea here is that the brain kind of acts as a uh, control center for the body. And when you remove that control center, 
the body just falls apart. It can no longer maintain this integrated functioning of the organism as a whole. And uh, so in the 1980s, when these concepts were being developed, uh, the idea was that without the brain, the body would quickly disintegrate. And the way that you knew that would be that the person would have a cardiac arrest. And indeed, in the 1980s, uh, the observation was that patients diagnosed as brain dead invariably suffered a cardiac arrest within a few days. No matter how hard you tried to keep them alive, within a few days, the idea was the body would disintegrate, it would have a cardiac arrest, and that was proof that brain death represented the loss of integrated functioning of the organism as a whole. Well, that was true in the 1980s. I think it's very clear that that's not true today, mostly because of advances that have occurred in intensive care. So today, such patients can be stabilized in ICUs. And once you get through a period of a week or two, then all of these physiological functions can, particularly in younger patients, uh, balance out. And they may live for months or years in a nursing home with uh, supports of a ventilator and a feeding tube. Now, what kind of integrated functions do they show? Brain-dead patients may digest food, excrete waste, grow, develop, fight infections, heal wounds, reproduce. Essentially, they can do pretty much everything that a healthy human being can, except for those functions that are related to consciousness, which is absent. So I know that probably most of you haven't heard uh, the thread of this argument before, and you may be thinking that I'm a nut. Um, I, I will say, though, uh, that in 2008, the President's Council on Bioethics looked at this in detail, wrote a book about it, and they fully acknowledged all the points that I've made here, that the integrated functioning justification of brain death is no longer valid. Now, where they went with that is another conversation we can have, but I, I left it out in terms of the short time that I have. Because I want to, um, well, first of all, let me say that I think that we see examples of this integrated functioning all the time around us. So um, every year there's a case or two of like this, uh, these tragic cases where a pregnant woman becomes brain dead during gestation, and her family asks that she be kept alive in the ICU for several weeks or perhaps several months until the baby can grow to the point where she can have a cesarean section and deliver the baby. And the headlines always look like this, you know, brain dead Canadian woman dies after giving birth to boy. But if you think about what the way that we've normally constructed brain death, this is wrong. That what this headline should say is that a woman who has been dead for six weeks just gave birth to a baby boy. And you never see the headlines framed that way because it seems quite non-plausible to any of us that somebody who'd been dead for six weeks could, could actually give birth. And I think it is implausible, and that's because patients can retain very complex integrated functioning uh, after the diagnosis of brain death. Perhaps the most famous example that's going on right now is the case of Jahai McMahon, um, a young girl who was diagnosed as brain dead after she had a post-operative hemorrhage following a tonsillectomy at Oakland Children's Hospital. December of 2013. Um, her parents rejected uh, that diagnosis, and long story, very long story short, she ended up being transferred to New Jersey because they have an exception around recognizing brain death. She had a tracheostomy and a G-tube, and I was just looking on the internet as of a week ago, there is a posting that she's still living at home now in an apartment um, with a feeding tube and a tracheostomy. I will say this, I probably should get a different picture. I think this picture is a little bit misleading um, because it looks like she's breathing on her own. She isn't. If you look under her um, uh, clothing here, you can see the outlines of the ventilator, which is connected to a tracheostomy tube. Um, she will never wake up. She will never uh, breathe on her own. But in fact, now two and a half years later, she's continued to grow. She's developed. She's gone through puberty. Um, again, demonstrating, I think, the integrated functioning that is possible uh, for these patients. So how do we respond to these problems? Well, brain death does not represent the loss of functioning of the organism as a whole, as our, our structure around it requires. Why then are not more of us upset that these patients are not, in fact, dead? And I think that in the West, we tend to overlook the fact that these patients are not biologically dead. Because we believe that they are irreversibly <coughs> unconscious, which is almost certainly true, we can talk about that, but I think there's little doubt that they are irreversibly <coughs> unconscious, 
and therefore we tend to believe that they are as good as dead. And I think that that has sort of deflected some of the concerns about this biological functioning. I think it is still an interesting point, uh, maybe a problem, maybe not, that the law requires that patients be biologically dead, not merely as good as dead. So why are there differences in views between the East and the West? Well, here I'm going to speculate. Uh, so I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm going to make a clear line here. Before this, I think I can pretty much justify everything I've told you in, in fact. Now, now I'm speculating, uh, but very much along the lines of what we just heard. And in the West, we tend to be Cartesians. That mind is distinct from body, and we associate life with the mind. I think Eastern cultures and religions tend not to be Cartesian. They embrace holistic views that are actually more consistent with the concept that death is the loss of functioning of the organism as a whole. And you saw a lot of that, that the idea that, that uh, life is not just a phenomenon of the mind, but that it is distributed throughout the body and the body's functions. So then why are Eastern cultures adopting brain death criteria? And here again, speculation, but the West has dominated the development of organ transplantation as a field. And, you know, being, being the, the first there, you get to make the rules of the game. And one of the rules of the game early on was that brain death is equivalent to death. And so for the East to participate in the international growth of this field, they have had to, albeit reluctantly, capitulate to accept these norms. And this has led, um, as Jim was saying, to the rather uh, curious way that uh, some countries, uh, Japan, I wasn't aware that China as well, um, really have two distinct understandings of what it means to be dead. If you want to be an organ donor, you can choose to be dead in a certain way, which I would say is largely a Cartesian uh, understanding. Uh, but for everyone else, we're going to adopt the holistic view that is more simpatico with our cultures and traditions. Um, what about when we move to, patient, to, to, to people who have come from the East to the West, where it's really not so much a question of whether they're going to be donating their organs, but more a question of you know, when are they going to be diagnosed as dead. And uh, here again, I think we, we see the incompatibilities. Article in the Atlantic just a, a short while ago about the difficulties of the Somali Muslim community in Portland, Maine, with accepting the diagnosis of brain death. And then on the right-hand side, this was a, a man that was cared for at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center a few years ago. We did it in our ethics consortium, uh, where the uh, diagnosis of brain death was not compatible with Buddhist beliefs. So I think, I think we see these issues you know, recurring on an international stage around the transplant issue, and then on a more local clinical stage uh, with people in our own communities. Um, so last slide, let me just say my conclusions here. I think the concept of brain death assumes that the diagnosis implies the loss of integration of functioning of the organism as a whole. We now know that this is not true, although these patients are almost certainly irreversibly unconscious. However, in the West, we still accept that brain death equals death because we are Cartesians. Mind is separate from body, and we associate life with mind. In the East, life is seen holistically as an integration of body and mind, which implies that brain death is not necessarily equivalent to death. So I think our comments are very compatible. Um, and uh, I look forward to having some conversation. Questions and I'll but I'll take the liberty of, of asking the first question. Uh, Dr. Young, you used you used the phrase a couple of times that the East lags behind the West in acceptance of brain death, and I think I, I know what you mean, and I, I don't think you meant to take that metaphor too seriously, but it, but it does seem to imply that everybody's moving towards the appropriate goal, and that the East is is somewhat behind in getting to the appropriate answer about all of this, which is that brain death you know, should be accepted around the world so that we can you know, declare brain death people dead and, and uh, they can donate their organs. Um, it, it raised the question in my mind whether providers in China, where you 
interacting with the providers. Um, believe this on a, you know, uh, are accepting of the brain death standard in a, in a sincere, intuitive fashion, or whether they're accepting of it in a legalistic or sort of a, or they're sort of separating their philosophical commitments from their medical duties. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking about your intuitions about how uh, Eastern providers view brain death intuitively. I, I say the short answer would be probably the latter. So uh, I, as part of my research process, I was looking online a lot at forums and how people uh, were discussing this. <coughs> and interestingly, in China, the pro side, uh, the people who are supporting brain death, often quote, uh, think, say things like, oh, brain death is a modern scientific standard of death. It's a, it's a sign that we are modernizing our medical field and we are aligning with the developed world. And they use that as a reason that people should accept brain death. So uh, they could, I think that reflects that the providers in China see themselves as lagging behind by refusing to accept brain death. While I was interacting with them, uh, I did ask, what do you think about brain death? And a lot of them would give me this generic answer, saying, oh, I don't think brain death really is uh, aligning with the traditional beliefs of Chinese culture. And uh, the, although they don't say any specifics of, about what the traditional beliefs are um, and how that applies to them, and it's kind of hard for them to verbalize that. I think many of the traditional, the cultural context may be more amorphous as we are growing up. Um, but they, they would then switch to their rational, oh, I'm a scientist, I'm a, a medical provider hat, and say, well, I can see the scientific uh, uh, concept behind this. I can see the, uh, the different uh, diagnostic tests, what exactly they're testing, and I can see the social utility of brain death. So I think there's maybe a lot of internal conflict among the providers as well. Sure, thanks. So my name is Emily, um, and me and my friend here are taking a class actually in Harvard College. Um, we're freshmen, and one of the papers that we read was your, your paper in the New England Journal of Medicine last year about the definition of brain death. And I guess I had, an, I had a question for you based both on that article and on this presentation. So it seems that you're simultaneously advocating both for to eradicate the definition of brain death we have right now, but still to have something in place that can have these kind of organ donations. So then would you advocate more of a organ donation definition of death that people can you know, opt into instead of having this definition of brain death that you seem to believe is you know, insufficient and in all ways a lie, I would guess, to the public, I guess? Well, first, thank you for reading my paper. So let's we'll stick with uh, brain death here. Um, I guess the short answer, I think, let me make sure I'm addressing your question, is that I believe that organ procurement from patients who are diagnosed as brain dead is ethical, but just not for the reason we have traditionally claim, which is that they're dead. Uh, it is ethical because, for two reasons, first of all, it's being done in the case of somebody who's given their permission to do that, or even asked to have their organs donated, and they're in a position, since they're irreversibly unconscious, where that donation is not going to be of harm to them, or at least as defined by them, it's not a harm. Their, their life is no longer a life that they want to sustain. And so in the process of, of their life ending, they would like to be able to give their organs and, and save the lives of others. So you can see it's a little longer explanation than just, well, it's okay because they're dead. But I still think it's okay. It's just for a different reason. Does that, does that hit it or not? Basically, yeah. 
you think that it's valid to call it brain death, or do we need to change the terminology? I think we need to change the terminology. Um, uh, you know, I think we need to identify what it is that they have, uh, which is permanently unconscious, permanently ventilator dependent, are really the key characteristics there. The President's Council agreed with that too. They adopted total brain failure uh, as opposed to brain death, because they, they didn't want to call it death either. Uh, but they were identifying sort of what was going on was sort of the failure of the brain to, to do the things that it needed to do. So I, I, I think that we were in agreement on that, but I would be more in favor of just calling it what it is clinically, which is you're, you're irreversibly unconscious and you're not going to breathe again. I will say that in neurological societies, there is discomfort with that term brain death because it's confusing. It could mean death of the brain. It's supposed to mean death of the organism. So a lot of neurologists, when they're writing about this, like to use the phrase uh, death diagnosed by brain criteria. It's too, too much of a mouthful to use, though, so we don't, we don't have a good substitute for the phrase brain death. Sounds like we might be going back to the 1950s term, apneic coma. Ching, do you have a sense of, so the, the thing that has led to, one of the major reasons that brain death is felt to be needed in the context of organ donation uh, in the West is because of the informal rule called the dead donor rule, as you know. Um, and what Bob has proposed doing is is saying that we don't need a dead donor rule as long as we've got a patient who is uh, not going to be harmed by donation and agrees to, to donate. Do you, do you have a, a sense of whether that would be an additional concept that would have to be uh, adopted, or is that something that's already part of thinking about brain death in, in Eastern cultures? Um, well, dead donor rule is kind of a very uh, dangerous subject to bridge. If we say we want to abol abolish the debt donor rule, then uh, it's like moving this line just uh, up, farther and farther up, right? Do we include persistent vegetative state people? Do we include people who are just in a coma, they're unconscious? You know, how, how much do we allow that? Um, talking about debt donor rule, it's a, it's a controversial topic in China because of the current situation of organ transplant in China. Um, I think some of you might know that the main source of organs in China right now is uh, death penalty <coughs> inmates. So right after they get the shot in their head, um, they are immediately taken to, uh, to the OR for harvest of organs. And this, uh, the, the, because of this, China has received a lot of criticism internationally, and that is one of the factors uh, promoting the government to do reform of the organ donation legislation and try to incorporate brain death into it. Um, there is also maybe unconfirmed reports of uh, live uh, organ procurement from certain oppressed groups uh, in China. Um, and uh, of course, these people who are doing that kind of report may have other agendas in mind. Um, but overall, I think removing organs from a person that we see as still being alive is unethical. And that would be unacceptable in either West or East. Very much, Dr. Yang, and Dr. Chuk. Um, my question is a slight step forward from uh, Taz's question asked you earlier. That is, um, based on your data, you, you said that in terms of the numbers of how many uh, medical professionals think that uh, brain death is ethical, you said 69%, as opposed to 75% in the US, which is very similar. And then brain death, uh, the question asked whether you think brain death is actual death. In China, 55% said yes. One of the, you said a lot of things that surprised you in, the, in your research. Did the element of what's actually happening in Chinese medical care based on the survey kind of raise the question or worry you in terms of it seems like you know, a quarter of medical professionals are thinking that it's legal, you know, that's, that's a big element as well. Does that tell you anything about the practice that's carried out in, in China in medical care? Well, I know that like some hospitals are declaring patients paid dead, or just switch up the ventilator, based on political expertise, I guess, on that 
or some people actually following certain guidelines or not. This discrepancy in care, um, doesn't that generate a lot even more ambiguity amongst the Chinese population when it's already starting in the medical profession itself? Yes, so the, that is why uh, medical professions in China are actually advocating for a uniform national guideline and also law, uh, either saying brain death is legal or not, and here's how you diagnose it clinically. Um, the Ministry of Health in China has been working on drafting such a guideline for over 20 years, but they never brought it to the point where it could be approved by the legislative branch. Um, just recently, they held a national conference on the topic and said, okay, we will move toward possibly uh, having a brain death law, but it's still probably years ahead to do that. And that certainly creates a lot of confusion. Um, brain death is not completely absent in China. There are certain uh, municipalities that allow declaration of brain death by the institutional guidelines. So certain hospitals, mainly a handful of major transplant centers in China, are able to declare brain death. Um, but majority, majority of the medical providers are not, and they do not feel comfortable doing that in practice because of lack of uh, both uh, medical professional guidance and also legal protection. And then again, my project, the research was based on a clinical scenario. So even though 55% said, okay, I think this patient is dead, if they actually face such a patient on the floor in the ICU, would they actually declare the patient dead or not? That's another question. I think probably far less people would actually do that. So uh, my name is David. I'm a medical student, but a neurology resident in two months. So I'm getting there. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so I was really interested in um, what you said about how people's conceptions about what constitutes life or death doesn't really seem to depend on religion or philosophical beliefs, at least as far as the regression indicates. Um, and that these decisions tend to come from a much more intuitive place. And that's really interesting to me. It, it, that seems right, that our identification of life seems to be a very visceral, uh, kind of intuitive um, determination. Determination is like kind of like porn in that way. You know, so we know it when we see it. Um, so and it almost seems like we come up with these rational de definitions to help support our intuitions. Um, but given that we see these differences in intuitions, I'm curious as to what you think helps to inform uh, those intuitions. At least in the, in the case of Western cultures, or maybe even Eastern, or Eastern cultures, maybe Western cultures, if it's not philosophy, if it's not religion, what is it innate, or um, what kind of factors contribute to those intuitions? That is a great question. Yes. <laughs> um, I was very excited to see that uh, in my uh, project that uh, emotion happens to be maybe one of the very important factors of how we make uh, decisions. Um, the way we were assessing that is in one of the clinical scenarios, uh, I said uh, this patient is a family of yours, of the provider. Then would you decide this patient uh, dead or not? And people showed that when when the patient was their family, they are less likely to declare this patient dead, uh, even though all the clinical signs were still the same. So that, that uh, informed me that emotional connection plays some kind of role. But then again, emotion is very hard to study in any kind of research project, especially if you want to do a controlled, more uh, valid experimental design. My guess would be it's probably a combination of what you said, like innate, and then also these cultural influences, um, maybe they're they are less on the ex explicit level. Maybe what we grew up with, we don't, like when we make a decision, we don't explicitly think, oh, because Confucius said so and so, therefore I should do this. But we feel like it's more natural to behave this way. But that's the way we are raised, or we observe other people behave that way. Well, I, th I think you, you've hit on it. I think that so many of the um, beliefs that we bring into the world are uh, formed in our childhoods, and you know we've lost track of where they came from, and yet they can be deeply held beliefs. 
So, uh, you know, I, I imagine it's a combination of all of those things that go into who we are, most of which we have no ability to access at this point. First of all, a culture is a temporal behavior pattern. So I think it is um, a culture change in a long term. And my question is, uh, in the US, the court has never punished prisons when the uh, prisons follow the uh, professional codes as a law. And the legal, uh, is now the legal officials are going to change. Or technologies are going to change. And is it because of the uh, informed concept of conversation of matters or some other? Maybe the, and the, the, is it technology is changing more upright or more in the course of the more complicated? in the, such as some more functional or I uh, well, if, I, if I understand your question, I mean, it, it's, you know, are, are cultural norms changing around uh, changes in the terminology? It's, I think, maybe what you were getting at. And um, uh, I do think that how, how, we, how we label things um, is, ends up being very, very important. And I think that's been one of the powerful ways that brain death has remained non-controversial because right in the right in the word is, is death. So uh, um, I, uh, you know it, it sort of deflects any any challenge or questioning right in the way that it's labeled. And when we start to call things different terms, I think then yeah there is an opening for more dialogue in society and the potential for change. While I'm walking Ching, do you have a sense that you had a definitional problem in that asking a Chinese uh, respondent about religion might, it might, the question about religion might mean something different uh, to a U.S. respondent in that, uh, you know, an intuition that somebody from the U.S. might call a religious intuition or impulse would not get called religious in China even though it arises from the same sort of instinctive place. Yes, I think it's possible. Uh, in China, religion and culture may be a little more intermixed. For example, Confucianism, you know, is it a religion or is it a cultural concept? There are Confucian temples, Confucian temples where people actually go worship, but people may not think of it as a religious place, where they would more likely to think of uh, like a Christian church as a religious place. So I think that's, uh, that's possible. The way we uh, ask the question, questions about religion in my survey um, is uh, maybe two questions. One is, do you see yourself as a religious person, as a person of religious faith, uh, just straightforward? Another question is, do you, how often do you visit places of worship? And a lot of people who in, in China who, uh, uh, who said that they are religious, and even those who said that they are not religious, uh, all said that they sometimes go to places of worship, and that included one of the things that we listed as the choices is folk temples or folk um, me memorial places. And so I think culture and religion may be more important. Anna Edelman, um, I'm curious about the explain the criteria for calling the patient uh, irreversibly unconscious and when they are con considered that, how sure are we that they are? That's a very challenging question. Um, so, <clears throat> let me try to address it this way. I think that we have had an intuition in our society that we um, understand the meaning of consciousness, even though when you, when you actually try to put it into words, it gets to be very difficult. But let me sort of begin with an assumption that, for the most part, we feel that we know when someone is conscious and we know when they're not. Um, the, the, one of the difficulties around that has been that a state of permanent unconsciousness, the, the persistent vegetative state, 
was uh, we thought we had a lot greater certainty in making that diagnosis years ago than, than, than we think now. And uh, you know whether uh, we're, we're now learning that many of these patients that we thought were permanently unconscious were not, and they were misdiagnoses, not not in the sense of anyone being sloppy, but you could only tell they were conscious when you put them into an fMRI machine and you watched how they responded to the questions and that sort of thing. So I think the whole issue of of when a patient is conscious or not has been thrown into a great deal of uncertainty. That being said, and I've had this conversation with, with Toss and others recently, um, what makes brain death different isn't whether it's the presence or absence of consciousness. We believe that PVS patients are unconscious and brain dead patients are conscious. But I do believe that we can have a much greater degree of certainty around brain death because the degree of destruction you see on the imaging tends to be massively more. And it's not true in every case. And I, I, can't, and I can't give you data. I doubt any data exists. But I, you know, my, I feel very confident saying to a family when I've diagnosed their loved one as brain dead, they'll say, is he dead? And I, I, my response is, he's legally dead. Because they are legally dead. They've met the legal criteria for our death. Um, but I, can, I, I do feel very confident, maybe more confident than I should be, I don't know, in saying that they will never wake up again, given the degree of, of damage that we typically see on the imaging. I wasn't prepared for that question. I didn't give the best answer that I, I think I would have. But, um, but that's, it's a really tough one. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, Toss, you've thought about these things a lot, too. Yeah. I mean, Bob, would you agree, this is a little problematic, but would you agree that it's never been seen a patient properly diagnosed using the proper tests with brain death has never regained consciousness or any neurological function right. beyond yeah. reflexive spinal cord? And I'm glad you said that because I, I always say that, that there's never been a case of anyone correctly diagnosed as brain dead who's ever regained consciousness. That being said, uh, it's a little problematic. So the rest of urban myths? Well, the, 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 the problem that you may be responding to is that the term brain death gets thrown around a lot and it is applied to cases in which formal tests of brain death have not been performed. Right? There are people, I've seen literature, uh, even in the literature, but certainly in the lay press, cases in which patients in coma, vegetative state, minimally conscious state, were described as brain dead. And so popular reports, you cannot rely on their description of, of what state patients were in. And so this is why we're saying that no well-described case of somebody who's been properly diagnosed as brain death has ever gone on to have any recovery. Uh, now, most of those the vast, vast majority of those patients have their life support term stopped as soon as they're declared brain dead. Um, so you might ask, well, then how do you know that nobody would regain consciousness? We, you know, uh, we don't. We talked about the numbers for this the other day. It might be dozens of cases of patients who've been kept on life support for months and even years after being declared brain dead, and none of them have ever shown signs of neurological recovery. So the data are limited but there's never been a real case. My name is Laura, and I'm from Harvard Divinity School, and I'm actually a resident chaplain at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, so my question is, basically, we work with medical teams at the Brigham to, after a medical diagnosis such as brain death is made, we're sent in to kind of talk with the families about what that means. And to me, this is really interesting, the thought of um, this being still a functioning organism to a certain extent and still being brain dead affects um, families who might not have a patient who has an advanced directive, for example, especially if it's a young person. And there, I have heard of other chaplains saying like, this family was so upset because they were like, wow, you know, our child is never going to be able to go through puberty. They're never going to be able to grow. They're never going to be able to change. But while in reality, that might actually be true. They might never be conscious again, but they might actually have those opportunities for, yeah, to grow as an organism. So my question is, now that we know these things, this is a more challenging conversation to have with a family about what their values are, what their needs are. Is there a way that you all recommend us as chaplains to kind of assist 
the medical team and having these hard discussions with the family what their values are. You guys are asking really hard questions. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> you know, um, I, I, let me, since I do work in an intensive care unit and, I, and I, I'm in a position of declaring patients brain dead, yeah. um, I've, had, I've struggled with how I, I deal with what I've told you here and yeah. how I work with families in the unit. Um, as, I, as I just mentioned, I, 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 I do use the terminology of legally dead because that is the case. Um, I have never in my career had a family ask me, you know, well, what exactly do you mean by legally? And, you know, what's the other stuff you're not saying? I, I don't know where I would go with that. But I do think in our, in our healthcare system, we deliver care as a, as a, as a team activity. And I, 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 it, would be, it would be irresponsible for me not to be a team player in that regard. And at the same time, I can come and have conversations with groups like this. Um, the, uh, the challenge, I think, of the Jahai McMath case for me is that when families have said, what are our choices now? The answer can be, I've already filled out the death certificate, which is true. Right? Um, and there's two things that can happen now. It's a possibility for your child to be an organ donor, or we will just turn off the ventilator and the child will go to the morgue. But what do you say now that there's at least one child where the family said we're not going to accept that and where there were religious communities in the country that were willing to have that child stabilize another hospital and ultimately living in the family's apartment now for two and a half years? Is that something that we're obligated to either disclose or if we disclose it, do we say, well, but if you want to pursue that, you're on your own? Or <coughs> Do you present it as an option, which I can tell you for the people I work with in the ICU, I mean, they're horrified at that thought. So these are these are the things that I'm struggling with, and so I don't have a great answer for you. Well, I think I think that in itself is helpful, you know, because we struggle with it too, and the families do as well. So it's just the question of like, how do you make that more vocal? I guess. So thank you, I appreciate it. Um, you, uh, Meg Soriano, I'm a master's student. Biotics program. Uh, you essentially just answered my question, I, I think, but I'll, I'll frame it anyway. Um, the way I understand the Japanese law is that families can choose not to accept the brain death. And so my question is, what is the ramification here if we adopted such a thing where people could say, because of Jahai's case, you know, I think that that's potentially going to become an issue. So for for your in your experience, when you say I've already filled out the death certificate, how much resistance do you? get on that? You know, actually, I think we have some, some way of answering that, in that the state of New Jersey has, for decades now, had a religious exemption to brain death that was brought to them by the Orthodox Jewish community, and it's been in existence for years. So that in New Jersey, any, any well, and it's not just limited to, to people who are Jewish, anybody can say, I don't accept this diagnosis, and you're not going to declare me dead on that basis. And it's not been a big deal at all. Um, I mean, it's not like New Jersey is the place where dozens of people have been, you know, in the ICUs or at home on ventilators who have been brain dead, or that or that organ donation has ceased to occur in New Jersey. Um, so they they we've already done that experiment. We've tried it out, and it seems to be no big deal. And a number of philosophers, Bob Beach in particular, has said. We ought to give people the choice, given what we know about what the diagnosis of brain death means. And I suspect if we did, probably little would change. Take one more question. This is a little bit the other way. Um, uh, there's one thing I'm confused about. You were talking about how uh, in the Western world, we were viewed more as an individual. Of course, in the Eastern world, it's more of a system, and we're more intrinsically linked with the people around us, um, spirits, things like that. How do you explain, or what do you think is the reason that um, in the Western world, organ donations are more likely to happen than in the Eastern world? If this is 
Well, I think individual choice definitely plays a role in organ donation. In the West, you have a driver's license, and you can designate whether you want to be a donor or not. And if you designate to yourself as a donor, there nobody else can say, I refuse to donate your organs, because it's, it's your organs. So I think that individualism, that uh, autonomy, really is, a, is an important concept in the West. But in Eastern world, um, open, so for example, in Japan, um, Japan revised its law about brain death in 2010. But before the revision, families can override the individual's uh, choices. So the individual may carry an organ donor card, but when it actually comes to donation, the family can say, no, I do not want my husband to donate organ. You cannot remove it. And the medical team would not do it. Um, but, uh, but because of that limitation, organ donation, especially from brain dead donors, was very, very low in Japan. For the 10 years, 12 years after the brain death was legalized, they only had maybe 150 or so of brain dead organ donors. So in 2010, they revised it. From a more social utility uh, perspective, they said, OK, family does not need to give consent. So since then, they, their organ donation rate actually jumped down. But I would actually expect it to mm, be more natural to people who give themselves Part of the system to donate their organs and people who give themselves an individual. Well, that's an interesting point of view about uh, how you help others. Um, but when when it comes to the your relationship in the system, it's really your relationship with the people you care about, your relationship with your family, um, your the people who you knew in real life, in the life of your dad. So. In a way, it's not about altruism, but it's about obligations to the family and to, to those who have direct contact. So we, we do have to say goodbye to the people who are joining us by our web stream. For anybody who is interested in staying and continuing the conversation, we will have some food and we will rearrange the table. So I encourage anybody who would like to. Uh, to stay and continue the conversation. Uh, for, uh, for everyone, I'd like us all to give our speakers a round of applause. And thank you.